Good morning, Claire. How are you? Morning. I'm good. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Super excited to have you today. Um, firstly, where are you? Um, I'm in Nairobi, Kenya. So yes, um, it's quite interesting that now um, with all these technologies, we can literally talk when we're miles away. Um, yes. So yeah. I was I was trying to remember all the Swahili I learned when I was in Dar es Salaam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's gone. So instead, I'm just going to say uh, Karibu, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, without taking any further time, just tell us very quickly a one-liner about yourself. Just quickly share with us a one-liner about yourself, um, aside from the work that you do, because from what you will share with us, we will get to know a lot more about um, your interest and passion for artificial intelligence. Yeah, awesome. So let me see one line about myself. Well, I'm Claire. I'm a female. Um, <laughs> I love math. Um, I love books. I love reading. Um, interesting fact. Um, I'm a I'm a very quick reader. I can. I think I. Some people say I can read over 500 words in I don't know a time span of a minute or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's just a quick fun fact about me. Yes. That definitely is a clear distinction between you and I because I'm not a very fast reader. So um, it's interesting to know that. And um, Ruben says, yay, Team Nairobi. Um, Ooh, all right. yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to hand over to you now to go ahead and just share with us an introduction to what artificial intelligence is, uh, where it's used in our lives, and of course, the future of AI. And um, to all of our guests, if you have any question, please, you're more than welcome to write your question in the chat and then Claire will take the questions as she goes along. We really would love this to be interactive. So please go right ahead and share your questions in the chat. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I think I'd like you to let me know if you can see my screen. Okay, great. Um, let's get started. Um, so um, just a brief, um, let me say, introduction again to myself and now with regard to data science. Um, I come from a very mathematical background. Um, I did um, statistics and that's eventually how I ventured into AI. Um, AI has been quite an interesting journey. Um, for me, it started very basic. And um, this introduction is not going to be anything, let me say, coding related or anything that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but rather it will be, um, let me call it a fun intro um, to what AI actually is. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to cover three main things. Um, the first one is what is AI? Um, I know AI is a big buzzword that people constantly throw around, but the question then becomes, what really is AI? Do you understand AI? And then based on that, we move on to applications. Um, what applications of AI exist? And then finally, we have our big questions, which is what everyone is asking. Is AI based? Will it take our jobs? And all these cool stuff. Um, yeah. So, what is AI? Um, for me, the first time, um, let me say, heard about artificial intelligence. All that could come to my mind was this movies, this sci-fi movies that where you you see a bunch of robots taking over the world. Um, somehow they have emotion and um, human intelligence and they they decide to annihilate all humans. Um, let me just start by assuring you, we are not yet there. Um, we are in an age called narrow AI, where AI is not able to really think like exactly like a human being. It can only do one task at a time. Um, and so artificial intelligence. Um, I like the description of AI to be short and simple. And among 
all the descriptions that I've ever come across, um, the one that really strikes me and get and, and makes sense is um, this one, and it was shared by Elements of AI, um, and it just says AI is a system that is both autonomous and adaptive. Very simple. Now you're probably asking, what is autonomous? Um, an autonomous system is basically any system that is able to perform tasks without constant guidance from any kind of user. Um, it doesn't require, let me say, any human help. It can run automatically on its own. Um, then the second quality of an artificial intelligence system is an adaptive system, um, one that, uh, that improves its performance and makes better decisions by learning from experience. Um, I like thinking of it in this way. So um, let me say for kids, for children, um, when kids are very young, um, they, 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 when they, especially when they start walking, they fall a lot. They stand up, they fall. They bump into something, they fall. They do anything, they fall. But every single time they fall, they're gaining some, some, let me say, experience or some memory or some data. They're learning, okay, if I walk towards this thing and it hits my foot, I will fall. So next time, let me not walk towards it. Um, and that's the exact same, um, let me say, thinking that has been put into what, making AI work. So given a piece of data, it's like, okay, um, Claire likes to eat ice cream on Sundays. Okay, um, using this data, it can then know, okay, next Sunday, Claire might, might most likely again like ice cream because it's learning from experience. Um, and um, artificial intelligence basically just mimics the human mind. It allows machines to be intelligent through learning and problem solving. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Um, I will quickly move on to the history of AI. Don't worry, I won't bore you with OSG, who coded where. Um, I'm just going to give you some brief touch points um, that I think helped revolutionize the AI space. Um, the first one um, I would like to say is that one that happened in 1955. So there was a group of researchers who came together to basically discuss about artificial intelligence. And it was during this conference or research day that the term artificial intelligence was first coined. Um, before that, many other terms existed such as thinking machines and all these other terms, but artificial intelligence was official in 1955. Um, then in 1997, we have an AI system called the Deep Blue um, that was actually able to beat the world chess champion, which is, I don't know, quite interesting. Um, and um, at this point, um, I know some people may tend to think, okay, does this mean AI is smarter than us? Um, then it also draws the question, how intelligent is intelligent? Because yes, this AI system could beat Gary at chess, but then again, the AI system cannot be able to cook like Gary, cannot be able to walk like Gary. So question then arises as to how intelligent is intelligent. And this is why I keep saying that we are still in the age of narrow AI, AI that can only do one specific thing. So the deep blue AI, very specific to chess, very intelligent at chess. Um, then in the 2000s, we have all these personal assistants coming up. We have Siri, we have Cortana, we have Google, um, all these cool things that are now making our lives easier. Um, I know some, some of us here cannot live without Siri. Um, I will not mention who, but I know some of us can't. And then finally, um, and why I've added this here is um, especially for if there are any data scientists um, in this um, meeting today, um, Alex. Um, so there was a competition in 2012 for image pro processing, that's basically computer vision. And AlexNet came up as a new CNN architecture. Um, what I mean by CNN is a convol convolutional neural network. 
So basically, um, it detects images, um, and it's 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 actually officially, let me say, sparked the current revolution that exists about AI, about machine learning, deep learning, data science, um, and this is because um, AlexNet made it possible to use GPUs. So between the 90s and the 2000s, the reason why AI wasn't expanding as much was because the machines being used could not be able to run AI due to due to a low like GPU that's graphic processing unit. Um, but AlexNet came up with this architecture that made it possible to do this. Um, and then it's made all this AI revolution start up and people were excited. People could now run AI models and do all these cool things. Um, yeah, so that's just a cool history about AI. Um, I have an assignment for everyone here today. Um, I failed to mention this in the history, but I don't know if you guys have heard of Alan Turing. Um, Alan Turing was um, a man in the 19th in the 20th century rather who was able to crack the Enigma code. Um, so the Enigma was a machine that basically um, the Germans were using during the World War to, um, to send codes or something like that. Um, and the only way was to build another machine that could crack the other machine. So um, the imitation game is just a, a replay of this movie. And when you look at the machine he built, it basically runs on AI. So I, I like to think that it was among the first AI that was officially built. Um, but yeah, just go ahead and watch the imitation game. I promise it's not boring. It's actually really interesting. And yeah, maybe you guys can share your thoughts about it on LinkedIn or, or, or on this chat if you've actually watched the imitation game. Um, yeah. So next on, I'll move on to related fields of AI. Um, it's very confusing to draw the distinction between AI, robotics, machine learning, and data science. So um, what exactly is the difference? So machine learning is actually a subfield of AI. It's the subfield that I like to say con concentrates on the adaptive part um, where the systems naturally improve their performance using more and more data. Um, data science is actually just a bit of everything. Um, it's an interdis interdisciplinary field that consists of math, statistics, computer science, machine learning, deep learning, and the whole goal of data science is to analyze and gather actionable insights from data using various systems, various softwares, various things. And it's basically just a whole bunch of things wrapped up in one. Um, and then finally, we have robotics, which is what people tend to be a bit confuse it with our current AI. And this is basically the design and construction and use of robots. Um, so um, it's literally the, let me say the handwork. It's like now building the robots themselves. But I'd like to just point out that yes, AI systems have to be fed into robots um, so that they can actually um, work, yeah. Um, and that's it for my intro to AI. I don't know if there are any questions or I can move on to now the fun stuff of how AI is actually applied. Yes. Okay. Um, applications. Um, I'm just sharing here applications that most of us interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but some of us don't really get to recognize or understand that that is AI. Um, so the first one, and it's very major everywhere, is image recognition, right? Um, so on this first image right here, um, you can be able to see that actually the boxes, this, this is AI identifying all these things. 
AI has identified that this is a cat, that this is a TV, that this is this is all these things. On this other side, it's identified the type of fruits. It's identified that this is a banana. This is one orange, second orange, third orange, fourth orange. Um, and this is basically using AI to recognize items, right? Um, and I know that um, Amazon is very major on using this kind of application of AI, um, and that's because they handle a lot of items. Um, the second one, I think most of us have a smartphone, um, and basically you, you, easily, you can easily unlock your phone um, just by it scanning your face. That is also AI under image recognition. Um, on the side here, you can see AI being able to analyze the facial expressions of this young child here and being able to tell whether the baby is fearful, whether the baby is sad, whether the baby is happy, and whether they, and when, when the baby is actually neutral, like you can't tell what they're actually feeling from their facial expressions. Um, and this is quite a cool cool way that we have seen AI being used. Um, to further clarify, um, I think you've, you've also seen that in terms of image recognition, you can actually be able to um, identify a specific person based on these CCTV cameras that are everywhere. That again is still AI. And then um, we move on to self-driving cars. Um, yeah. So um, self-driving cars actually implement a lot of AI systems into one so that they can actually work. Um, so we have, um, first of all, sensors. They use sensors. They, again, use still image recognition so that they, are, they can be able to tell if there are other um, items around by what are these items. Is it a human? Is it a toy? Is it like all these things? Um, and then they automatically drive, right? Um, so I think the biggest brand out there has been Tesla, but then we also have these other brands. We have Google also doing self-driving cars um, and all these other systems that are currently doing self-driving cars. So when self-driving cars officially, like when first started out, um, so many people were, let me say, skeptical and that's because um, how, how can you trust a machine on the road? Um, but the good thing I like to think with AI is that it learns again. Um, and a lot of data has to be fed into these cars so that they can be able to identify all these different things. And I'm honestly looking forward to, yeah, a world with less accidents and less, um, less um, issues on the road due to human error thanks to self-driving cars. Um, and then um, I think this is very, very common to everyone, content recommendation. When you go on Netflix or when you go to YouTube and you watch um, a song, a rock song, maybe you like rock, um, you watch a rock a song on rock, um, the next day when you come in and open your YouTube, you'll also find some other rock songs recommended to you. Um, other than this, when you watch a movie on Netflix, let's say you, you like rom-coms or you like comedy and you watch all these things. Um, and the next day when you come, it's recommended you similar, um, similar like um, movies or series or all these things that is AI being used to create relevant content for you. It's like custom making content for you. It knows that you like watching this and so I will give you this. Um, people who are similar to you like watching this and so I will recommend this to you because it's highly likely that you will like it. Um, and these are just some of the, the normal, let me say our day-to-day applications of AI. Um, other than that, um, now we actually have applications of AI in industries. Um, I picked out these four because I feel like they are very major industries um, in, in the world right now. We have health, we have agriculture, we have finance, and we have education. Um, you're probably thinking, okay, how does AI work in health? Okay. 
So um, yes. I'll give you an example. Yes. Before you just go a bit deeper into the different industries and how they use AI, just going back there to where you were talking about Netflix and how um, mm -hmm. let's say today I watch Bridgerton and then tomorrow it's recommending for me content similar to Bridgerton. Um, you know, there are cases where you and I, let's say like we went to the same restaurant together. Mm -hmm. um, we maybe did talk because we know each other or like are just acquaintances. And then later on I get home and then Facebook says to me, people you may know. Is that yeah. um, a use case of AI as well? Definitely. So um, AI is basically just feeding on data. It's feeding on the people you know, it's feeding on the things you do, and it's doing, it's using all these different data points to um, create or recommend things to you. Even like when you're shopping, um, sometimes you can go on Google um, and, and search for washing machines. And then the next thing that pops up when you watch a YouTube ad is a washing machine. Um, so it's all different data points that are being collected to then um, be able to provide you with the content that you actually want to watch. So, yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting because it happens when I don't necessarily like post a picture with you, but I will mm -hmm. like get home and legit Facebook will be like people you may know <laughs> and they yeah. have Claire. So interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to um, let you continue. And I also just have a comment here um, mm -hmm. that somebody would like to discuss with you just a bit about AI and its use in real estate. But we can get into that okay. just a little bit later. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So real estate, interesting. Anyway, um, um, as we move towards discussing that, um, let me mention a bit about AI in health. Um, so, as as let me say, Claire. Um, yesterday I was feeling a bad headache, like terrible. And then today again, I still have a headache. Tomorrow, who knows what I'll feel. Um, and let's say last week, um, I was diagnosed with um, let me say a stomach flu. Um, the other week, I was diagnosed with something different. Um, so all these things are data points. And if I was to fall sick next week, all these data points would be very crucial to help determining what I'm likely to be suffering from. Um, and AI can easily come up with this. Um, so there's been a lot of controversial talk about why we're giving mach we're taking the power of doctors away from doctors. But the thing is, it's not really taking power away from doctors. It's helping doctors come up with a small list of possible symptoms or diseases that someone might actually be suffering from. So that's AI in diagnosis. Um, I don't think that um, um, many of us know how expensive it is to develop medicine. It is so expensive and then it has to go through all these trials and testing. And then after that, it still has to be approved. And most of the medicine that we see today has undergone a lot of rigorous stress testing and most of them don't even make it to the market. Um, so AI comes in into this part and just helps us to develop medicines and takes into account various data points such as genes. So sometimes when you're developing medicine, um, it can be able to tell all these things. Um, and then we have customer experience. Um, sometimes when you go to a hospital, there are emergency issues and we don't know which emergency issue is more important than the other one or there are crazy lines. And using AI, we can be able to get to know um, which, which, which patient should go first um, and all those things. Um, and then I think on surgery, surgery is actually a mix of robotics and AI. And um, basically you've seen these robot hands that are able to perform very, um, let me say, precise um, surgery su 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 procedures and all that. And yeah, and I think I'll move on to agriculture. So in Using AI, you can be able to predict weather using um, AI. 
you can be able to monitor crops and diseases. Um, actually, recently I came across um, something that um, using an app, you basically take a picture of a plant um, and then it tells you that um, it's um, your plant has this disease and this is basically what you should do. And it's using image recognition. Um, and I think that's super cool. Um, then you also monitoring of, you have monitoring of so soil health. Um, in finance, um, I think AI is very big in finance as compared to all the other industries. Um, and this is because of several reasons. We have forecasting, we have fraud detection, um, especially in terms of um, when people are trying to claim funds or all those things. We have improving customer service. Um, I know most of us have interacted with chatbots. Um, chatbots don't get tired. They don't go through all these phases. And so it's so easy um, to have them help and benefit your finance business. Um, then finally, we have education. Um, I think everyone is, um, everyone learns in a different way. Um, and so using AI, it's now possible to have individualized learning. It's the same way Netflix recommends certain content to you. You can now also be recommended the content that suits you for you to be able to learn better. And then we also have voice assistants that help people in learning. Um, the applications of AI are endless. I think um, I can talk about it day and night, um, but this is just a bit um, of them. Um, then um, as I finish up, um, I like to answer these big questions or share my thoughts on these um, since most people really are um, like, like to know about this. Um, and that the first one is, will AI take our jobs? Um, let me answer this in this way. Um, we, um, Elaine mentioned that we are currently in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, this has brought about new and emerging technologies um, such as AI, blockchain, and basically the whole point of these things is to make life easier. In the other industrial revolutions, let me say, for example, when electricity came along, um, I'm sure candle makers ran out of business or something like that. But I'm sure we also can, we, it would be unfair for candle makers to protest and say, no, um, we, can't, we can't have electricity on board because um, our jobs are being taken away. Um, it's up to the candle makers to adapt and know, okay, what, what is this new thing? What is electricity? Um, what, okay, it's making my life easier. How do I then adapt? Um, and then also the other thing I'd like to note is that right now AI is creating so many new jobs. And, and I would like to challenge actually all of us to learn something about AI. There's so many new roles coming up. And again, as I've mentioned, AI cannot function on its own yet. So we still need people to develop these systems. We still need people to maintain them. We still need people to monitor them. Um, so let's all upskill, let's all work together and, um, and have a human machine integration. Um, and then finally, the other question is often, is AI biased? Um, I'd like to say no, AI is not biased. Um, and this is because it has no emotions, it cannot, it cannot be biased on, on someone or something because it basically has no capacity to feel. Um, it can only be biased if the data fed to it by us humans is biased. So um, I'd say that the AI system that are termed as biased, um, we cannot really blame the AI. We can in turn only blame us as humans for feeding it biased data. And you're probably wondering, what, what are these examples of biased data? Um, recently, um, some, some studies have shown that um, some image recognition softwares are not able to recognize um, people, people of the black ethnicity as much as they are of people of the white race. Um, and this is biased, not because the AI chose for it to be that way, but because the data fed to it was mainly of people from one race. Um, and that is not on the AI side, that is on our side. Um, so um, as we move towards this journey of AI, um, let's try to be ethical. 
um, let's try to do things in the right way. And I know um, we will be able to change um, a lot in the world. Um, yeah, so thank yeah. you so much. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, Claire. So just on the note of like AI being biased, etc. I think when you're talking about like how some racial, sorry, <laughs> not racial, but facial recognition softwares don't necessarily recognize like um, our black skin. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I don't know how to put this and I don't know if it's necessarily, you know, within like the AI um, spectrum, but I will literally go on Pinterest and Google, like, for example, how a certain top will look and they will feed me with pictures of how white women look in that in that picture is that um, a use case or where AI has not been programmed uh, correctly by the people who set it up? Um, I think that's basically um, search engine and I think it's it's mainly because um, most of the images uploaded there are of people from one race um, so again it comes to the kind of data that we are collecting and actually the thing with um africa is as we're still opening up um we have we 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 we're so um tied to our data um and that's a good thing we need to be tied to our data but then again um we need to also be a bit open and share a bit just because when we're searching for um all these images we we also want to see ourselves we also want to see people like us um and doing this yeah. will, will help eliminate all this bias yeah for sure um so i guess then what you're saying is let's learn about ai let's get involved in it so that we ourselves are the ones programming and in that instance you know there is that aspect of representation that as a black mm -hmm. person, I will go on Pinterest search and then therefore see images of black people. And I don't have to type the word black woman wearing green skirt <laughs> because that is legitimately what I need to do now. Like on Pinterest, for example, if I want to see images mm -hmm. of black women wearing these particular um, colors, for example. And I have a question here from David Nene. David Nene is a data scientist at Advernet Africa. Um, and his question is, please mention on some of the ongoing projects in AI that are happening in Africa. Yeah, so um, some of the ongoing AI projects, um, I don't want to speak for everyone. I think I'll speak um, for what us as AIC are doing in terms of AI in Africa. Um, so um, I work for the AI Center of Excellence and basically we're, we are doing different things using AI there. The first one, we're actually training guys on AI. Um, this is just so that we can have more people um, participating in AI. Um, this is both data scientists, um, Python experts, AI engineers, um, and also we have leaders, because again, it's very important to have leaders understand um, the benefits of AI to their businesses, um, because this is the only way we can then be able to implement it and help the continent grow. Um, another AI project I'd like to mention is basically research. Um, earlier in my slides, I had pointed out health, education, agriculture, um, and all these things. So some of these have been done um, for the European market or from outside market, but not for the African market. Um, so um, interest, it would be interesting. And what we are currently doing at AIC is just um, trying to gather African data to be able to develop African solutions using research. Um, yeah, and I think um, that, I hope that answers your question, David. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. And we also have another question from Dorcas. Uh, oh Lord, I'm not gonna butcher your surname, sorry Dorcas. So I'm just gonna say Dorcas. And Dorcas is a lawyer from KSL. And Dorcas says, the use of AI has brought a lot of advances. How do we balance the use of AI and robotics in regulated fields? For example, in medicine, if we use an AI um, for surgery under supervision, who is to blame when there is a technical hitch? Yeah, um, so 
Um, let me just say again, as I've been mentioning, AI basically works on data. So the more data you feed it, the more accurate it becomes. Um, for such fields, I'd say the accuracy has to be super high before you can even release it into the market. Because um, yeah. for medicine, it's dealing with people's lives. Um, so if 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 you're asking for someone to blame when there's a technical hitch, um, I would say that it would be very hard for this to happen because again, before any AI system is released, the accuracy has to be super high. Um, it has yeah. to be able to do what it needs to do at a very high accurate level. So yeah. So are we blaming the programmers? Um, so in we, that instance, I think yeah. the blame, yes, would fall on humans because we can, I, again, I find it weird to blame an AI because it doesn't really like it's, it has no choice. Like it's it's yeah. it only does what what I want it to do. Um, yeah. as far as now, so, yeah. yeah. And if I see yeah. it has errors, then there's no there's no possible way that I should be the one to I should release it again to the market. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm going to invite Crystal up, up on stage. Um, and as she said, Crystal is our southern africa hub leader crystal is in harare zimbabwe and um she is an entrepreneur of course part of the patf team and she is quite passionate about real estate so she just wanted to have a conversation with you about ai as it relates or as it's applicable to real estate welcome crystal how are you well, thank you for having me um hi claire i've been really enjoying your session very general very eloquent thank you. So I'm very excited um okay so let me share my video let me share my video sorry about that okay um oh, very close to the screen right um before i go into the real estate use case we're actually just laughing behind the scenes with lorraine <laughs> we're talking about how english can trip you up and uh, we were wondering, um, is there any software out there that I can speak in my native language and it automatically translates, but in my voice? <laughs> because it's really, it's really, yeah, to speak in English and actually put yourself across. Um, is there anything like that in the market? Um, not that I know, but actually interesting, it's interesting that you've mentioned that is because recently my friends and I were having this conversation where um, right now Siri has a very English American ish accent. And it would be interesting to have a Siri with like an African accent, like South African or Kenyan yeah. or yeah, something mm -hmm. like that it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I think you can actually have your Siri speak in a South South African um, English accent, but of course it's more like your um, like white Afrikaans people accent. So <laughs> that, that's the English that you would speak. So it doesn't necessarily have like a Zulu English accent or a Setswana English accent. That that's not the mm -hmm. one. Okay, all right. Okay, I'll get right into it. Um, in real estate, we have the part of valuation. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, as it is, we rely on a licensed valuer to give us um, a valuation that we can work with. Right. Mm -hmm. You see banks have a valuation department, real estate companies have a valuation department and all of that. And I have found that with every real estate company you go to in every bank, there's always a difference, a discrepancy in the valuation. And even if you go to the municipality, like if you want to make a decision, you have to use three valuations, the municipal, the, the bank, and um, the independent valuer from a company or whatever. So mm -hmm. I wanted, I was thinking into to the use of AI in terms of valuation. Um, mm -hmm. How best can you apply it in this case of um, real estate? We want to have a bit more closer to the actual number without having human interaction. 
be just coming and entering just certain data about the building that I need evaluation on. And then the AI picks up information data around the other aspects that are included in the valuation of a property in terms of um, neighborhood, mm -hmm. other sales history, and all of that. I, I need you to, to help me there um, be able to, to, to express it in the AI language, how this can be applied. Yeah, so thank you so much, Crystal, for that question. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually very interesting that um, um, I was working actually on a data set. Um, um, so what, okay, let me just say that generally what I've noticed is happening currently is that um, a real estate agency has properties, right? Let's say they have properties in Johannesburg and they have all this data on all these properties. They have um, the location, the size, they have the number of rooms, they have the type of house. Is it a condominium? Is it a flat? Is it all these things? Um, and for that specific agency, um, they then try to get the valuation using just AI, like predicting based on these different factors, like as I've mentioned. Um, now, what, what, what you're saying is I think that we need to expand our view. And this is why I'm also saying um, it would be very important if we could share data. Um, if we have 10 different real estate agencies in South Africa um, or Zimbabwe, um, and we have them come together and say, okay, these are the houses we have, these are their values, um, this is the, the number of rooms they have, the size, this is where they're located, um, and all these other things, and you have this one single massive data set, um, it will then be able for anyone to come in and input certain figures of a certain building and then easily be able to get a valuation. Um, I don't know if there's an application or, or, or something for it out yet. Um, yeah. Um, that is actually one thing that um, we, we as I'll, I'll go into what I do as property handle, blockchain mm -hmm. startup. And that is actually something that we want, we are addressing. We want mm -hmm. to create a parallel market in the real estate market because um, the valuations that um, that we base on um, are done on the the market that comes from the stock market where mm -hmm. they trade real estate so big and all, and they give out the data that they want to give out. They set the peg on valuation, and we just roll with it because that's mm -hmm. what's there. So yeah. a market that is parallel that is open to anyone and everyone and the littlest transaction that we can is all available i think that will actually help that part of ai mm -hmm. to be applicable in valuation if all yes. that every transaction that can happen if we can plug in the if we can plug in the tax man if we can plug in the the deeds registry if we can plug in and then now all that data is available in one central and also transactions pass through that platform, then we can have all this data for anyone to have. It's for public consumption. So even if you don't want to use our platform, you can still come and see that in the past um, three months, in this area in Johannesburg, there have been 5,000 properties that have been sold, and this has been the average valuation, and this is the, the, the future that we anticipate for that area then it's best it's better for ai to actually make um predictions better close uh, predictions and also helps the market data needs to be transparent it needs to be available for everyone mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so we need and i think that yeah. the ai center for excellence can actually play a huge role in in helping us achieve that Yes, um, I think we can have a conversation outside of this um, and we can share some more yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah, a more in-depth conversation just to go a bit deeper into AI and its use in a real estate. Um, yeah. Thank you, Crystal. I'm going to take you off the stage now. Okay. Um, I have just one last question for you, Claire, and this question is from Dorcas again. Thank you, Dorcas. We love that energy. Um, and she is asking, 
how do you balance the need to protect the public without stifling innovation? Um, so um, I don't know, Dorcas, is this question in relation to data um, or is it in general relation to AI? Um, so, okay, I'll just answer it with relation to data. Um, so I can, see, I know you're in Kenya. <laughs> So um, in Kenya, we have something called the Data Protection Act, um, and it was it was recently implemented, I think, last year. And um, most Western countries already have it in place. Um, so those are just different measures to protect people's data and what, um, let me say, some a third party can do with this data. Um, and so I'd say that the main thing here is policies. Policies, policies, policies. That's the only way we can balance this need to protect um, the public um, and again, still um, not stifle innovation. Um, yeah. So it's a policy, policy, policy. That's our best friend yes. in this. Case. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Dorcas, you're a lawyer. So this, this, this falls on your docket. <laughs> Yeah, she should be typing up those policies yes. by now. She should be typing up those policies, be like an, an innovation lawyer or something, um, and uh, doing all of that. Um, Claire, I think we have had a really um, interesting conversation with you around AI, what it is, where we're going with it, and so forth. And I know that you said, you know, in, uh, you'd really like for all of us to just learn a bit more and get involved so that we can be at the forefront of creating the solutions that are applying AI in our day-to-day -day lives. Before I let you go, I'd just like to know what is, um, <laughs> Dorcas is laughing at the fact that I said she should be typing the policies. Yes, ma'am, <laughs> that's what you should be doing right about now. Um, so please just share so that I can write it in the chat, the movie mm -hmm. that you suggested we all go and um, watch this learn a bit about the history of, of AI. I'm going to write it in the chat. Um, it's called The Imitation Game. Imitation. Imitation. Yeah, imitation game. OK, OK. Yeah. So you guys better watch it. it, and you better like it. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, okay. Where, where, where um, could they find you on LinkedIn so that they can ask you um, where to and to let you know their feedback on the imitation game and if they think it was a great movie to watch. Yes, yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn at Claire Matuka, um, but I will still share my LinkedIn um, here yeah, on the, the chat, chat, I think, for everyone to see. Um, and yeah, we can share more and yeah, just talk about AI in Africa. So yeah. Fantastic. Um, Asante Sana, Claire, it's been such a pleasure having you. We love women in tech who are all about it. And thank you for taking the time. I think I speak for everybody that we learned quite a bit. If you agree with me, please give Claire some hearts and uh, clap thumbs up in, in the chat there, as well as just a quick reaction. Uh, yes, everybody agrees with me. I love that. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you. Thank so you. Much, of course, we'll see you now in the chat where you just share a bit on how people can get in touch with you. Um, to yeah. everybody who'd also like to get in touch with Larry Monza, who was doing our training on um, introduction to blockchain, please also just reach out and we will connect you with him. Thank you, Claire. Linked in um, here yeah, on the, in the chat, chat, I think for everyone to see. Um, and yeah, we can share more and yeah, just talk about AI in Africa. So yeah. Fantastic. Um, Asante Sana, Claire, it's been such a pleasure having you. We love women in tech who are all about it. And thank you for taking the time. I think I speak for everybody that we learned quite a bit. If you agree with me, please give Claire some hearts and uh, clap thumbs up in, in the chat there, as well as just a quick reaction. Uh, yes, everybody agrees with me. I love that. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank, thank you. Of course, we'll see you now in the chat where you just share a bit on how people can get in touch with you. Um, to yeah. everybody who'd also like to get in touch with Larry Monza, who was doing our training on um, introduction to blockchain, please also just reach out and we will connect you with him. Thank you, Claire.